Hello everyone, welcome to the 180 Literary and Jury Charge. We're going to start out with an, an article on the weather. Okay, ready? One of the most important factors influencing the environment is the weather. People have had to cope with the fluctuations of weather patterns for centuries. With all of the advancements in technology, we still find ourselves as vulnerable as ever to rain, sleet, snow, hail, and drought. The science that deals with the study of weather is known as meteorology. The weather phenomena takes place in a relatively small portion of the atmosphere, which extends 6 to 10 miles above the Earth. This area is called the troposphere. The air in the troposphere is in constant movement, which explains the changes in the weather patterns. Meteorologists have learned about the weather and its cycles. We do not hesitate to make predictions and forecasts, but all too often the factors affecting a weather forecast can change dramatically, making any prediction totally inaccurate. Okay, I'm going to give you some legal. Ready? The illegal taking and carrying away of the personal property of another with no intention of returning the property to its rightful owner is called larceny. Robbery is the taking of the property in the presence of its owner with no intention of returning it. Ownership is legal title to property. Possession is the physical control of property. Criminal intent is necessary for a person to be found guilty of a crime. A confession is a voluntary statement offered by a person admitting involvement in a crime. An admission is not a confession. Defense is the denial of the accusation. Okay, I've got some closing arguments here. Ready? Council has made a big point about Mr. Meso being a working electrician. He is no more a working electrician than Mrs. Near is. He kept his union card for 20 years because he gets benefits for keeping it. He hasn't worked as an electrician for 20 years. He gets on the stand and under his attorney's prompting says, Really, what I wanted to do was become a journeyman electrician. That is really what I wanted to do. Garbage. He is making $39,000 a year. He no more wants to be a journeyman electrician working in the field at 54 years of age than any rational person who would have happened to have his work history, and yet that has been added up there. He just arbitrarily took some numbers and said, now multiply by some years, and my God, we come up with a million dollars easy. There is one other little point. Who says he would work 40 hours a week, 12 months a year? There has been a slowdown in the industry around here. Unless you have got your own business, and there is no testimony that they will work full time all year around, but Mr. Roseman, he has got his chart made up. All right, I may be boring you. I could go on forever. It has been a long trial, and there have been a lot of things that have been said. I am not trying to duck down on any issues. What I am suggesting to you in plain old English is that this lawsuit has been deliberately and intentionally built. Just that simple. You know, I am not much of a diplomat. I say what I think, and I think there is plenty of evidence in this record to substantiate this, and yet they want the lady to be responsible for it. We are interested in justice here. That is really what we are here for, justice, justice, whatever that nebulous little thing means. Mr. Meso is entitled to justice, but ladies and gentlemen, that lady is just as much entitled to justice as anybody in this courtroom. It hasn't been pleasant for her sitting through all of this listening to this there is nothing wrong with him that came from this accident nothing if i have done anything to get you mad at me get you annoyed at me or in any way get you angry at me hold it against me don't hold it against my client she deserves better in a long trial you never know sometimes a lawyer does something that just rubs the jury the wrong way and you don't hear about it until after the verdict is in. You know, if you knew about it, you wouldn't have done it in the first place.
but it has been a long trial. So, if I have done anything to bother you, don't ever come to me with legal work, but for heaven's sake, don't hold it against my client. She deserves better. Ladies and gentlemen, all I am asking for is justice in this case. Don't make what you saw happen in this courtroom profitable because... If it becomes profitable, my goodness, away we go. I am asking you based on the evidence, not because you like me or don't like me, based upon the evidence that I think is credible in this case, I am asking you for a defense verdict. Mr. Meso can in no way exonerate himself from liability and setting up and contributing to this accident, and that bars him and the compensation insurance carrier from recovery of any nature. He has been well paid for this minor rinky-dink automobile accident out there that they are turning into a federal case. Thank you very much for your time. All right. My next article is on the railroad. Ready? For over 200 years, the railroads have played an integral part in the development of the United States. In 1804, the first stream, or excuse me, steam locomotive that ran on rails was developed. The first American railway to be used was the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company Railroad. This pioneer railroad was used to haul coal. In 1830, the first daily train service operated on the South Carolina Railroad. From these early beginnings, expansion was rapid. Railroads were used to haul freight and passengers. After the Civil War in 1869, railroad tracks were built westward from Omaha, Nebraska, and eastward from Sacramento, California. The tracks were united at Promontory, Utah. Railroad expansion has continued to grow since that time. With the development of modern steam locomotives, the railroads can provide a fa fast and inexpensive mode of transportation. We're going to continue on with our jury duty selection. And again, this case may sound familiar to you, but it's only because I read some of the opening statements um, a while back. So if, if that sounds familiar, that's why. Not because I've already read this to you. Okay, here we go. And we're in the two-phase process of picking the jury. The first phase, which we're doing right now, is time qualifying. Can you afford the time? You know, I'm a strong believer you should sacrifice a little bit for your country, but I don't want you to take out a second trust deed on your house or go to any extreme. That's the kind of thing we're going to go through right now. For those people that have the time, we'll have a questionnaire for you to fill out and you'll come back May 3rd to actually have the in-person kind of voir dire you to see or what you've seen on TV where attorneys will ask you questions and we actually choose the 12 people. And that's the part that goes to the merits. Can you serve on this case, on this kind of case? Your attitudes, things like that. Here's some things to remember. What if you had a civil case or getting sued for money or whatever and you were the one that was sitting at the council table? Whether you are the one that's at the council table as a defendant in a criminal case, or if you had a loved one, what kind of juror would you want sitting in the box? You'd want jurors who would render a verdict according only to the evidence. You want somebody who is going to be honest and answer questions honestly. You want jurors who will follow the law. You will want people who will follow the orders of the court. For example, the orders not to discuss the case with anyone. You want people who will follow the law even if they disagree with it. Think of a Saturday morning soccer match. Think of a referee that makes his or her own rules as he goes along. 
All the players and coaches and fans, they know the rules. They prepare and everybody has agreed on those rules. And here you have some referee making up the rules as he or she goes along. It would drive you nuts. Same thing with jury service. You have to follow the rules. We want you to use your common sense and exercise discretion. You have to follow the rules based on the evidence. And that is evidence that's varnished by any knee-jerk reaction. You just have to listen, pay attention, and make your decision based on the evidence and nothing else. It's not a short case. It's going to be 7 to 11 weeks. I think we'll be done before the end of June, but just in case, I'm estimating July 9th. And there's a couple of unknown factors here. For example, deliberations. A jury can take as short or as long as they want. It's entirely up to the jury how much time you take for deliberations. That's an unpredictable factor. Then we have witnesses who come in and the direct and the cross-examination might be brief or it might be a little longer. We have a general idea but not an exact idea, so those things make a difference. Then we have lots of days off. You can see all the X's up there. Those are days you aren't here. For example, the week of May 10th, we're not here. I have to teach a school somewhere. It's a judge college kind of thing. I committed to it a long time ago. I have to go. The third Wednesday of the month, we're off. Court furlough day. You heard of the court closures, DMV and other kinds of places. We have them too, third Wednesday of the month. And on Friday, I'm doing civil matters. So really, we're going Monday through Thursday. Go ahead and flip it over. And then you can see more X's for various things. But those of you who can serve on the time element, you'll go down and fill out that questionnaire in the jury assembly room downstairs and be back here May 3rd when we'll finish selecting the jury and get right into evidence shortly thereafter, okay? Who is here? My court reporter is on my left. There are two of them. They take turns. My right is my chief assistant and always here. There's always only one of her, totally not able to be cloned or replaced. Always got to be here. I have my deputy and other deputies, two or three deputies. They wander in and out. They take turns and it's not unusual, especially in the later, like in the morning and later in the afternoon. There seems to be a lot of deputies around. They're finishing out their shifts or whatnot. Nothing unusual. It happens all the time. Let me give you a brief summary of the case. Brooke Marie Rodders, Omar Hutchinson, and Francine Epps are charged with the murders of Marvin Gabriel, age 22, and Milton Chavez, age 28. They are also charged with two special circumstances, alleging that the murder was committed during the commission or attempted commission of the crime of robbery, and that the defendants did commit multiple murders on August 27th of 2006. Marvin Gabriel and Milton Chavez were last seen leaving a bar in Riverside. It is alleged that both men were murdered at the National Inn Motel located at 420 South Lincoln Street, Corona, on August 29, 2006. Their bodies were found in the trunk of a car, Gal Gavlin Springs area, of the unincorporated Riverside County near Lake Matthews. Those are only allegations and the only truth is evidence that comes out on the stand and you're the ones that determine the truth or not. Those are the only allegations. The jury commissioner has already determined that you meet the minimum requirements to serve as a juror. I will repeat them now. Citizen of the U.S., at least 18 years of age, live in the state of California, resident of Riverside County, not previously convicted of malfeasance in office, not convicted of a felony, and not had your civil rights restored. 
sufficient knowledge of the English language, not currently serving on a grand jury or any other kind of jury, not subject to conservative proceedings. If anybody thinks that one of those things applies to them, raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. The jury commissioner did his job. We have given each of you a calendar. I haven't, but it's up there on the board. And you know, I want you to think about that when we go over the time qualifying part. The law is contained in the jury instructions. They're in two books called the California Criminal Jury Instructions. They have the numbers. When people say you have to follow the law, it's the jury instructions that I read to you, which you have to follow. And you have copies of these when you go to the jury assembly room. I'm going to read to you one right now. It is 100. You must not talk about the case with anyone. Do not let anyone talk to you about the case. You must not do any research on the internet or anywhere else. Avoid reading any media accounts about this case. Okay, and it's true. That's one of the instructions. I'm giving you an order. You can tell somebody I'm in a murder case. We expect to be done in seven to 11 weeks. And that's about it. You can tell them all about it when the case is over. But until then, you can't. So that's the kind of thing. It's the law. It's pretty much common sense. There's other ones you will have to follow. I've told the attorneys not to, you know, mingle with the jurors. And that's why you want to wear your juror badges so everybody will know you are a juror. These attorneys won't do that, and neither will the staff. But we say it out loud so you'll know why they don't seem friendly. We don't even want the appearance. We are very careful about those things. Next, we will determine if any of you should be excused because the jury experience would impose an undue hardship on you. The law is very strict about granting hardships. The law views jury service not only as a privilege of citizenship, but also as an obligation of citizenship. If we selected only jurors who had nothing else to do, we'd have a narrow cross-examination of society. Experience shows us that having a broad cross-section of society, making these important decisions, is a much better way to go. In a moment, I will listen to any claims of undue hardship. I will then make an evaluation based on the law and let you know my decision. If you are not requesting that I excuse you due to extreme hardship, I will send you on to the next phase, which is filling out the questionnaire. So in a few moments, when those feel they can serve the amount of time required, you'll go out the door. And on the podium are two pieces of paper. One is this calendar type schedule up on the screen. You can take one of those. And next to it is orders from the judge that tells you what I've just told you. You want to go down to the jury assembly room, fill out the questionnaire they give you down there, hand it in. You're coming back here May 3rd. So those people who can serve the time required, you go ahead and leave. Take one of those pieces of paper. Go ahead and leave right now. Attorneys, the three attorneys and my court reporter and my clerk come back in the hallway for a second. We're in the hallway, just the attorneys and my clerk and court reporter and myself. This group is going to take a long time. There's a lot of people who apparently think they have good excuses. We have a fourth panel downstairs, which I don't want them to sit there all day and do nothing. So I'm going to just take a small number of these people, do the hardships, send the rest away until tomorrow morning. And then we're going to bring up the fourth panel, so at least we can get the volunteers in right away. I don't want them. That will avoid them having sat all day and being totally wasted. So let's go until three, and I'll have the next group come up 
at 3 o'clock, okay? I'm going to question the people in the box and everybody else I'm bringing back tomorrow morning. Okay, that concludes our jury charge and literary for the 180 class. Have a great day.